Hi, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us in the second session of uh, the AAC webinar series. Uh, this is the third time around we are doing this. And uh, today is the second session and the topic is going to be common AAC implementation pitfalls and helpful strategies to correct them. So I'm sure this is something that's going to be really useful for all of you. Uh, and we have with us uh, Lauren Enders. Thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us. Uh, this is again the third time that Lauren has joined us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's such a pleasure to have you here. There's always so much to learn. Yeah. Uh, so let me introduce Lauren for those who may not have heard about her. So Lauren Enders is an uh, SLP in, and uh, she is an AAC specialist and an AT consultant work, working for Bucks County in Pennsylvania, USA. She has more than 25 years of experience and is extremely passionate about providing access to communication and empowering parents and caregivers. Uh, she presents at a lot of leading international conferences and has a lot of followers on Facebook and Pinterest. And she's extremely um, passionate about sharing a lot of resources on social media. So in case you haven't followed her, please start following. There's tons of resources out there. Um, I, I'd also like to say that uh, for any questions or comments, for comments, please use the chat box. For questions, please type on the question panel. And uh, we will be conducting a brief, a quick poll towards the end and a survey as soon as you exit the um, webinar. So please do share your feedback. So this will help us improve our offerings to you the next time around. So over to you, uh, Lauren, we look forward to your session. Okay, thank you. All right, hi everyone. I'm almost ready to say good morning because here it is, uh, you know, 7:30 in the morning. Um, but I realize it's good evening to you if if you're in India. So um, good evening. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about common AAC implementation pitfalls. So things that I am seeing in my practice, both you know, I, I work full time in the schools, uh, but also that I see you know the parents and professionals, um, paraprofessionals, all kinds of folks. Um, sharing that they're experiencing when they're trying to implement AAC and, you know, some of their frustrations. Um, and I'm going to try to suggest some helpful strategies that can kind of get you beyond those, those pitfalls or those challenges. So you already heard all this stuff about me. You don't need to hear any more about that. Um, these are just a couple things that I'm hopeful that you'll be able to do after this session. One of them that you'll be able to name at least three different, you know, common pitfalls that negatively out, um, affect outcomes for AAC learners. Um, explain the concept of inspire, don't require, which is a, a term coined by my friend and colleague, Rachel Madel. And uh, share why asking too many questions uh, with, with your child can be problematic. So um, the slide handout is the slides that you're looking at. Um, but it's important to note that um, if you go back and you view the slides later, um, anything that you see uh, that has an underline is a live link. Um, so there will be links to certain resources, or even if you see an underline in the text of the slide, then that generally almost always is going to mean that there's something behind it. Um, on some of the videos, there's a little YouTube symbol at the bottom, and most of those have a link to the YouTube uh, video that I show. So uh, hopefully you'll find those helpful after the fact. Um, I do want to mention before we get started that there will be recurring themes. You're going to hear me talk about a pitfall, and then you're going to hear me talk about a fix or you know, some suggestions to get past that, that pitfall or that challenge. But what you're going to notice is that many times the things that I suggest, the strategies that I suggest uh, for different types of pitfalls may overlap and may be similar. Um, one of those that is an absolute, you know, essential in supporting AAC learners is modeling AAC. So it's sometimes referred to as aided language stimulation or aided language input or partner augmented input. Um, there's all kinds of names for it, but it, what basically that is, is that as you speak, so if you said, you know, I'm going to go to the store, that as you speak, you would point to or activate 
uh, symbols on the uh, system, whether that's a, you know, a high tech system uh, like Avas, or if you're using a, a, a paper core board, um, as you said the word go, you would also point or activate the word go. And that's what modeling is. Um, and it is really, really crucial. So you're gonna, you're gonna hear that theme um, repeated throughout. And uh, you know, I might sound a bit like a broken record, um, but if you asked me, you know, what is the single greatest um, uh, downfall of AAC implementation, um, I would say that, that um, unequivocally that it is that, that it's not being modeled because we, we need language modeled to learn language. Um, one example that I love to give is that I, um, I really liked taking languages in, in high school. I took four years of Spanish and then I, you know, I really liked Spanish. So I went to college and I took four years of Spanish in college. So, and I was a Spanish minor and I was, you know, um, had eight years be behind me, uh, but I never went abroad. I never went to a, a country where I got to be immersed in Spanish. Um, so despite eight years of instruction and being able to pretty read pretty well, I never became a Spanish speaker. Uh, and that is because I was not, um, I was not immersed in Spanish. I was not receiving uh, interaction with people who were speaking Spanish. They weren't correcting me. They weren't kind of responding to me. I wasn't getting any of that interaction and I didn't learn to speak it. Uh, and that's one of the things that really gets in the way because we as natural speakers, our first instinct is not to be actually talking to our, our child, our student, um, is not to be talking to them with the system, not to be actually pointing to symbols because it's not the way we communicate. So that is one that's going to be one of the hurdles to get over. It's actually not hard. And I have, uh, I have a couple examples that I'm going to show on video of some suggested um, things not to do as well as an example of, of a parent who has really done her homework and she's, she's really doing a great job modeling. So you're gonna to get to see some you know, kind of positive and negative um, models in, on video as well. Okay, so you will see these Slido slides pop up. Um, this is just to get some, um, just to get a sense of you know, kind of where you are as an audience. If you have access to a phone or tablet and you want to just point the, the camera or um, I don't know, depending on your phone, you might need a QR code reader. There's the QR code at the top. You can also go on the web to slido.com and there's a, a um, code down the bottom. But if all of this is a little bit complex or you don't have the, uh, if you don't have the technology to be able to you know, have another device to do this um, or you know, to, to Put a window aside to do this it is completely fine to read the question and then throw your answer in the chat so i will try to glance at both i do want to let you know that when i look off to the side it's not that i'm trying not to look at you but i have a secondary monitor and that's where my chat is and my questions are um, and also where i can see um, the gallery of 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 um you know like images and myself and all that kind of stuff um, well, we've got somebody answering with Slido. Um, so my first question is, how familiar are you with the concept of modeling AAC? So are you, you know, very familiar but need practice? You've heard of it but have no idea how to do it. Um, you know, totally new to the concept. So you can put it in, I've heard of it but don't know how to do it. Very familiar, very familiar. So I think it looks like we're going to have like a real mix of folks familiar but need practice. We've got a pro out there. Congratulations on your pro status. No idea how to do. Started using it. So it sounds like we have a really, really nice mix out there. Um, I, I do want to be kind of your cheerleader today. Um, even if you have no idea how to do it and you're completely new to the concept. Now, um, you know, you won't likely walk away today feeling like an expert because you're going to need to practice. Um, but I will say that there are, um, you know, there are, there are some great videos out there um, and I can give you some suggestions on kind of who to follow and what to look for. Um, it's just something that you absolutely get better with practice and you need to be willing to make mistakes. 
um, when you first start out modeling and you're talking to your child and you are trying to navigate um, a system, let's say you're using Avaz, you're trying to navigate Avaz, you can't find the button, you have to find, use the search, you're fumbling, you, you, know, you went to the wrong page, all of that is okay. All you're doing is validating for your child, hey, this is hard, it takes some learning. You might even have the opportunity for your child to be the teacher sometimes. So you could say, well, how do, do you know where this button is? Um, I want to say cookie. I, how do I say cookie with your talker? And sometimes your, your kids are going to know more than you do. Um, so I, you know, again, I just want to say that even if you need practice, um, you will be able to do this. All right. So this is something. Um, this is Dr. Joanne Caffiero. She is a, an AAC expert and an autism expert. Um, she's retired, but um, I've, I'm fortunate enough to um, be friends with her on Facebook. And as I was perusing my news feed last night, I saw her response. Um, somebody was asking, um, I think they were asking for support for modeling. You know, what could they tell a family who was maybe a little resistant to modeling? And this was her answer, that parents of typically developing children naturally use simpler but still robust language. And our language expands and becomes more complex in response to the feedback we're receiving for our child. And that's what I was missing in Spanish. I didn't have people speaking to me in, in simple, robust language. I didn't have people responding to me, um, you know, giving me feedback. Um, she said the teaching little one's language is built into our DNA. So you are equipped to do this. It's just, you know, a little bit of practice when you add in that you need to find some, some um, buttons or cells, depending on whether you're using a device or, you know, a paper support. Um, and she did mention that there is a TED Talk. Now, it's, it's pretty deep, this TED Talk. Um, I did watch it last night because I was curious. Um, that is a great example of the importance of responsive feedback um, loop with, you know, parents when a kid is learning language. Um, and this TED Talk, um, this, this gentleman actually, and it's, and again, it's, it's kind of, kind of heavy duty, um, but it might be something that interests you. He, um, he set up cameras all over his home, um, and recorded, I, I believe, I don't know if it was the first five years, like constant recording. He had millions of hours of recording of his entire home of all of the language that was spoken to his son from the time they brought him home from the hospital until he was like five years old. Um, so it was a really kind of fascinating talk, but, you know, thinking about how he talked about um, how they spoke to the, his son and how his, his son developed language, um, you know, we need to do similar things with AAC. We need to be able to, um, to use modeling the same way that we do that with our natural speech modeling. So I thought that was, you know, just interesting that I came upon that last night from um, Dr. Paffiero. So one of the first pitfalls um, is, boy, do we like to talk as adults, um, the communication partners doing all the talking um, can really be a challenge. Um, and I think we do all the talking for a number of reasons. Um, but in essence, that when we're doing too much of the talking, it's gonna limit their language opportunities. Because if we're talking, you know, we're, we're certainly not gonna be, you know, having us talking and them talking at the same time, hopefully not. Um, and you know, how can they process their own response to you, whether you've asked them a question or whether you um, have made a statement uh, or whether you've shown them something and that they want to respond to. If you are constantly talking, um, they have to process the language that you are speaking. And for a lot of individuals with disabilities, um, processing the speed and processing ability may not be where, where ours is as, as you know, typically in developing adults. Um, so they may have delayed processing. They may have very delayed processing. I have worked with kids. Um, now, not every student is like this, but I have absolutely worked with um, students or children who um, it takes them 30 seconds, 40 seconds, as long as a minute for them to actually take in the auditory information that, in a, that somebody says to them, process what was actually being said, and then formulate the response. It, it can be you know, quite a lot of time. So if you are just talking, 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 prompting, 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 talking, 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 
all they can do that entire time is try to process what you're saying. So they need some silence to be able to then finish their processing and then um, generate their own response in their head. So we fear the dreaded silence, but it really does encourage language formulation. Um, so my suggestion uh, is that when you are interacting with your child, anytime you are hoping that they might use their communication device or, or, or provide some kind of communication, maybe it's use their speech. Obviously, um, we have plenty of kids that, have, that use speech and AAC, um, and that's completely fine. Um, but if you are looking for them to respond, whether it's with their device or their, their board or whether it's with their mouth, um, it's really important to have that silence. And we're going to talk also about kind of an expectant look um, so that they can formulate. So, you know, a rule of thumb that you can follow is 10 to 15 seconds of silence. It seems like an eternity. So what I'm going to encourage you is to have enough silence that you feel uncomfortable, that it feels weird. Um, I have to count in my head. So I will say that our human nature makes us want to help. We want to be really helpful. So, you know, we ask a question or we, we make a statement and we're waiting for our child to respond. And then they don't do it within about a second. Our human nature, we're right in there and we're ready to, to prompt again or ask another question. But remember, you're then gonna be interrupting their processing. So for me, even though I am an experienced uh, AAC modeler, um, um, a speech language pathologist, I know better, my human nature still makes me wanna jump in way, way, way too soon. So I actually count in my head. So I'll say, oh, I wonder which of these foods you think is delicious. And then in my head, I'm going one, 1,000 to 1000. I'm actually counting in my head to force myself to give that processing time. Um, and it doesn't matter that I have 25 years of experience, I still have to do that. Um, so counting in your head can be a tremendous help. Slow your speech rate. So remember, you know, not only do they have to process and they, they might have some processing delays, they might have some processing challenges. Um, so, and now we're not talking about speaking like a robot, but, you know, try not to speak uh, at, you know, the, the speed of sound. Uh, I know I tend to speak very quickly. Um, so, you know, really being conscious to kind of slow your speech a bit. And then that expectant look. So you want your child to know that um, you want to communicate with them. You want to connect with them. You want to build this relationship with them through language and that you are willing to wait, that you will be patient um, and that you expect a response, not that you require one. And we're going to talk about that, but you, you, know, you, know, you expect a response. And one of the ways you can do that is with body language is that, you know, if I said to you, so I, you know, I wonder what you're going to do today after we're done our webinar. And I kind of tilt my head to the side and, you know, I look kind of, you know, I look at you like, you know, eyebrows up, lean forward a little bit. I'm, like I'm expecting you to give me a response. And then I start counting in my head um, and I'm going to count at least 10 seconds. Now, if I am working with a child for a while and I realize, you know what, typically I get to about six and they answer. Well, then you can reduce your time. Maybe you can count to, to six or seven. Um, but that's a really, really um, important strategy to use. So the powerful pause, this was a, a blog post by Susan Kerner. Um, and she talked about the fact that providing uh, a pause gives the AAC user an opportunity to share information that they need to share. It allows learning to take place. Um, and that you should be pausing your voice and your modeling. So if you, if you were like, oh, I wonder where we should go, and you model the word go as you say it, I wonder where we should go today, then silence. You're pausing your modeling with your finger, you're pausing your speech, and you're counting in your head. It takes practice. Um, I will say that one thing that is not used as often as I think it can be, which is an incredibly, incredibly helpful tool, is video. It makes you cringe. Um, but if you can record yourself on video 
interacting with your child and then watch it. You will likely hear very little silence, very little wait time, way too much prompting. Because again, your human nature gets in the way. If you, but if you can regularly just capture some video or have, you know, if you have, if there's another parent in the household, just say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to read a story with, with, um, you know, with her. Let's, let's say, can you just record me so I can, you know, see how I'm doing. When you go back and watch it, I, I think there's really, really um, incredibly beneficial information just by watching yourself um, that will help you the next time. So expecting, this is the second pitfall that I see, and that is expecting that your AAC learner will have immediate interest in the system, will use it immediately, and will show immediate progress. Um, language learning takes time. You know, we don't see infants coming out of the womb um, as, as, you know, completely competent language users. Um, and when we think about many of our AAC learners, we have kids, um, individuals who may have some intellectual impairment, they may have language processing challenges, there may be all kinds of other factors that are not only making them um, learn language at the same speed of a, a typically developing child who's learning language, who gets years to really hone their language. Uh, we don't expect anything until they're maybe at least a year and a half. Um, yet we're talking, modeling, shaping, um, expanding. You know, if we have a child and they toddle up and they say, ball, our natural parental instinct is to say, yeah, it's a ball. Oh, this red ball, this, you know, this is my favorite ball. Let's, let's play with this. We do that super, super just naturally. Um, we know what to do. It, like Dr. Cafiero said, it's in our DNA. But as soon as the AAC system is involved, we can get a little bit stressed out because we don't know where things are and we don't know what we're supposed to point to. Um, and, I, and I'm hopefully that, that you'll see some of these videos and get a better sense um, that it's really not rocket science and that with some practice, um, I feel certain that every single person that is attending today has, has the, the skills and the ability to do this. Um, but we need to understand that language learning takes time, that I mean, you, you know, it, it will not work to uh, set up a system, whether that's paper or Avaz or another system, uh, put it in front of, of a child and then start asking questions. Um, you know, that, that's just kind of expecting, you know, almost like, you know, language learning by osmosis and it doesn't happen. Um, so it takes time. Um, and here is, uh, you know, a statement from Jane Corston from several years ago where she talked about the typically developing child doesn't even demonstrate language competency until around nine to 12 years old. And they've been practicing oral language for 36,000 hours. Um, and they've that whole time they've been receiving corrective feedback with the spoken word. So if you have a child, um, you know, use a word with their system, um, you know, if you can go back in and say, oh, you know, no, we're not, you know, we're not going to do that, but guess what we can do today? And then you model the language that we, that you are going to do. You are then giving them corrective feedback or expansion using symbols. And it's okay if you are not ready to be plunking out full sentences. In the beginning, even if you represent one of the words in a sentence, um, oh, I'm so excited to go to the zoo today. And you just you just worry about finding go in the system. You're not even worrying about all those other words. The more you practice, what happens is you can find more and more words um, that, that correspond to what you're saying with your natural speech. What you also develop as you practice is a, is a skill at looking at a screen or a, a board, whatever you're using with, with your child, um, and being able to just kind of pick out some words on there and just say something that you can model. That's a, that's a skill that comes along with practice. Um, and it's something that I've developed over the years. And I will say that I certainly was no good at it initially. Even though I had a degree in, in uh, speech and language, doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I was not good at it at all. It took me, it took me some time, all right? So, um, you know, we need to remember that, um, that the development uh, in AAC learners, language development is a process. Allow time for their achievements model a lot, but don't require their response. We're going to go into that a little bit more. 
um, about um, demand type of, of language, which um, doesn't go all that well, but we, we are so eager for our children to become communicators and to share their wants and needs is a, is a big concern I hear almost always with parents. Is I, I need to know what he wants, you know, so that we don't have meltdowns because if, if he can't express that, then we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna have an issue. Um, you know, it, it goes way beyond that, but that's one thing. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about you know the, the type of language we use and and the fact that we should not be requiring responses um and to acknowledge and expand on all their communication attempts you know even if they communicate something that you were not expecting or that was not the response that you had in mind another you know huge soapbox of mine is that communication is about autonomy really when we communicate, we, we communicate what is in our mind. We communicate what we're thinking. Um, and that's what it's about. And when you can be an autonomous communicator, um, Gail Porter said that you can communicate uh, who you want to communicate to, um, what you want to communicate about, when you want to communicate it. You have that power. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very important that we not view language, not view communication as compliance. I see this a lot. You know, I want you to ask for a drink. Okay, if you want a drink, you need to ask for a drink. And our intentions are pure. We absolutely want them to learn how to say drink. We're not trying to be tyrants. We want them to learn, but we go about it. Our natural instinct is often to go about it in the wrong way. Um, because first of all, we we are not mind readers and we don't know if they actually want to drink. So to, you know, you, have, you need to tell me you want to drink, you know, who says that they do? Um, we certainly as parents, you probably know your children better than anybody, um, but you're still not, you know, clairvoyant. <laughs> um, all right, so this is an example. So this is Kate Ahern and she shared this video with permission um, from, um, from this child's mom. Um, and what I want you to take away from this video. So Kate is a very experienced, she's a special education teacher. She is an AAC expert. She's an expert in pretty much, you know, every type of AAC system. She uses just about every app. She uses just about every dedicated device. She's used pod, she's used all kinds. Uh, but I want you, what do you, I want you to pay attention is that she is just modeling with this child's device some only some words she's using all of her natural speech then sometimes you'll see her model she'll also talk about what she's doing oh i'm going to clear she's doing a lot of talking about the how operationally she's using that she's explaining those things to this child but what you will not see is her ever say tell me on your talker or use this or say it so i just want you to get a look really quickly i'm not going to probably pay the whole video um, and the other thing that Kate does that's so beautiful is she truly, truly follows the student's lead. I can guarantee that this silly activity with the ball was something that was discovered during the session with this child. This was not her plan for the lesson. But when she learned that this little guy loved pushing the ball into the box, she went with it. She followed his lead. And that was what she made the interaction about. <laughs> okay, whose turn is it? <laughs> whose turn is it? Is it my turn? Or is it your turn? Whose turn? Oh, you're giving, you're giving the ball to Kate. All right, here I go. Should press give. Here ball. I go. I'm gonna do it again. Roll the ball. A one. A two. Oh, I'm gonna do it again. A one. Two, three. Oh, I did it. Clear. I'm giving the ball to you. Give. Here. Oh no. Whoa. Oh, try again. Try again. Try again. Yay! Good job. Good job. Can you get it? You rolled it. Good job. Is it Kate's turn? You gave the ball to Kate. All right, Kate's turn. Here we go. Ready? A one, a two, a three, woohoo! I got it in! Okay, I'm gonna give 
Okay, so what you saw, uh, and that's just a beautiful interaction, and that is everything that we want to do. Um, she is not requiring, she never once says, tell me on your talker, tell me give, give, tell me ball, um, say ball. If you say ball, I'll give you the ball. Or it, none of that. What she is focused on, and this is what I'm, you're going to hear me again, you know, broken record. You're going to hear a lot of themes repeated throughout this, um, throughout this session. Um, but what she is, is doing is she is focused on the interaction. She is focused on just the joy of the relationship and modeling language. She is not concerned whether he says any particular words in this moment. She's taking the opportunity to naturalistically model those pieces of language, which is what we do with our natural speech, supernaturally. Like just, we, we do it just automatically, it's in our DNA. So that's a really great example of modeling without um, expectation. <laughs> okay, so another common question is, well, but how do I get my child interested in the device? They don't wanna look at it, um, they're not interested in it. Um, is this something that you have experienced? And you can use the chat to say yes or no, um, or you can um, use the Slido. So most people have experienced this. There's a couple of no's. Um, and sometimes we do have an, in, you know, we have an individual who is just super, you know, excited for to use this, this talker, use this system right from the beginning, and, and you don't see that. Um, but in other cases, you have, a, you know, an individual who's, who's doesn't seem at all interested. Um, but remember, um, you know, so there's a mix, but I would say that more of you are saying that you have experienced that challenge. Okay, so that's good to know. So, you know, I think what this points to um, is that, you know, they need to know what language is, how language works, what it is that they're supposed to say um, before they can develop, um, you know, the feeling that it, even what this thing does that's in front of them, what, are, what is it for? They need to understand the power of language, that, that language will get them things, that language will give them your attention, that they need to learn that when they say something with their talker, that you, oh, you pay attention, you give it back to them. So if they say, um, they say sick, and you say, oh no, you feel sick? Oh, let's go to body parts. Oh, is it your stomach? Now, maybe you don't think that, that your child is sick. You're, you're sure that he is perfectly fine. How, number one, how can you be sure? You can't read their mind. You think you know your child pretty well. So, you know, um, but the other thing is you always want to um, reflect back, acknowledge what your child said. Even if you think maybe they hit the wrong button or it's wrong, we don't want to say, oh, no, no, no. You know, you're not trying to say sick. You're trying to say um, happy because happy was right next to it. And you thought that that was what they meant to hit. Just go with sick. Oh my gosh, you're sick. Oh, let's go to body parts. Is it your stomach? Is it your shoulder? You know, and you could even, you know, be silly. Is it your butt? Oh, you know, so just work on that interaction. And if they say it's their butt, if they say it's their elbow, oh, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Let's rub your elbow. I'm sorry that your elbow hurts. Go with it. You know, use the language as a way to interact. So what one of the best pieces of advice that I can give you is to shift your focus from the device or a specific reaction uh, or response on that device that you're looking for them to give you a particular answer. You want them to ask you for a drink. You want them to tell you um, what they want for dinner. Um, that shift from the expectation that they say something in particular to focusing on interacting with your child because you also will feel so much more successful if you're not looking, because you know we can't be sure what they wanna say anyway. So you cannot really judge accuracy. So let the accuracy thing go 
um, now you can always, obviously you can shape, you know, if they, if they say something, if you say, oh, well, you know, which, which body part is the one that we smell with? And you're being, you know, you're kind of interacting and you're reading a book and it's a book about smelling and they go in and they, and they type, you know, thigh. You'd be like, thigh? I don't think my thigh can smell. So you want to re respond? No. And then we're going to nose, nose. You push nose on the talker. Nose, we smell with our nose. And then you want to repeat as many times as possible. And you'll see an example of this. I smell with my nose and then you model nose. Dad smells with his nose and then you model nose. The more times you can model, the better. So repeat yourself a lot. And there's, an, uh, there's a, a video I'm going to show you from uh, lots of Comptons where a, a mom and her um, other child and her, 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 his sibling who uses a, a device um, there's a, a great example from her and you'll see how many times she repeats the word go a lot. And you saw Kate, she repeated um, give an, or roll many times to Bodhi. So follow their lead like Kate did. What is most interesting to them in the moment? And, and you know, with, with um, children on the spectrum, you know, you have some really, really targeted interests and that may not be all that focused on your interests but try remember this is about the interaction and try to join them where they are what they like like kate did with bodhi i don't know that kate's first priority during that day was rolling a light up ball into a wooden box my guess is no but somehow she discovered that that was what he wanted to do in the moment and she went with it and it became this beautiful interaction and then she didn't require that he talked about it, but she used it to model, 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 model. And when that model, model, model happens, over time, they will start to learn and use it. Prompting too much and too quickly. I got to get move a little bit faster. I talk too much. Um, so we do need to pay attention to the fact that the definitions of prompting and modeling are actually different. Prompting is trying to make someone say something, something that you want them to say. That's not what we're going for. We're not going for compliance. Um, you know, modeling is the act of being a model. So you're modeling how they would use language and that's what we're going for. So, you know, you are not trying to get them what you expect them to say. We, we, we start that way. Um, that's our gut, um, but that's actually not the idea. What you are trying to do is help your child become an autonomous communicator. So you don't want to train them to say the words you want them to say. You want to teach them to say the words that they want to say. With each prompt, we need to remember that we restart their clock. So all those prompts, we need to add that silence because we need to give them a chance to respond, to, to process and respond. We can use a prompting hierarchy or a, a modeling hierarchy. Um, we can reduce the number of prompts by a lot. Uh, use that video, record yourself. You'll be shocked at how many times you say something and how quickly you jump in, one second, less than a second. Um, add lots of wait time, avoid physical prompts. I've had seen lots and lots of kids. There's a couple different things about physical prompts. First of all, unfortunately, kids with disabilities and kids who have complex communication needs are much, much more susceptible to abuse. We do not want to teach kids that it is okay for people to take over their bodies. So, you know, hand over hand, if can all be going to be avoided, um, I suggest you do. Also, I see a lot of kids that will grab the adult's finger to use their talker, um, which is not what we're going for. But when we, when we use hand over hand, that's what we're teaching them that they need. So there are a couple hierarchies. These are going to be here for you. I'm going to, you know, run by them quickly in the um, in my discussion here. There's one from Gail Van Tatenhove that's a little bit simpler on, you know, what you do first. We start from least to most um, intrusive, what we can say. Um, and this is the one from Kate Ahern, which is a little bit more, um, you know, it, it's more involved. She talks about the fact that modeling is is going on at every level. Um, so those are there for you. Um, we talked about counting in your head. We talked about this, you know, that we won't want to be doing hand over hand. If you absolutely must do a physical prompt, 
putting your hand under their hands so that they at least see their hands or maybe asking them like Marlene Cummings from uh, Michigan says to hop on so that they have some autonomy that they are placing their hand on your hand. So they, they have more of a role in there. So that's another possibility. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show this example. Now, you know, I found this on YouTube and what I wanna say off the bat, and I don't know if this is, a, uh, I'm guessing this is a mom. Um, this is not to bash this parent. Um, I would say that every mistake that she makes that we can try to identify, I'm sure that I have made many, many times. Um, and even since, since I got my training in speech language pathology, um, but I thought that, you know, some of the, the things that she does, um, which are not ideal, are a really good way to illustrate what not to do. And then we're going to look at um, a little bit better of an example. But again, this is not an attack. I am, you know, she recorded herself. She put it out there, which I think is absolutely fabulous. And it's, it's a learning experience probably for her and a learning experience for us as well. So I thank um, I thank her for, for posting this and I'm not attacking, um, but we'll use this as to illustrate a point. So keep an eye on this and um, think, think about if you see anything perhaps that, that should be done different, differently. Jason, come here. Jason. Jay, come have a seat. Have a seat. Hi. That's you. Yes, have a seat for me. Ready? Okay, let's move to the bench nice and close. Ready? Okay, I want you to pick out some food. Okay? Can you show me? Ready? Chips. Where are chips? Granola bar. Okay. Ready? Can you point to chips? Eggs. Eggs. Okay. No, that's not it, but it's okay. We're going to find. Ready? Mm. Chips. Where are chips? Chips. Good job. Yay. Good job. Yay. Okay. So there's lots to kind of unpack here. Um, and I don't know that we need to do, I, I think we're, we're going to, we're, we're running short on time. So I'm going to, I'm going to, just kind of explain before we go into this this next example. Um, I'm going to explain kind of what I picked up and what I'm hoping is that you picked up some of the same things. So one of the things that I picked up, first of all, it was all about getting the child to say exactly what she wanted to say. Second of all, she did not respond to what he did say. So that's not used as a teachable moment. So if he says, and she wanted him to say chips, and he said, I can't remember even what he said, um, but you know, let's say that that he said cracker. Um, she just said no. You know, she's not all. She's not allowing any any babbling or exploring. She's sort of corralling him. She used hand over hand. Um, she just said no when he didn't get what she wanted. Um, and when he did ask, when she did use hand over hand and she had him press chip, instead of giving him a chip, she blew bubbles. So again, um, you know, I thought that this was kind of packed in, yep, so not making him point. She was very fast. She was not, she was not saying, oh, let's see if you can find the word chip and then stopping and using an expectant look and waiting she was not she was expecting immediate she she wanted to she wanted to ask him and have him immediately respond with what she wanted to respond so having seen kate's interaction i think you know it's a really great just juxtaposition of um you know she probably could have given chips instead of bubbles exactly exactly um because what you need to remember is that even if a child like if you said um you know, find chips, even if maybe they could find chips, they may not even know how to use the word chips in language. That may all have to be modeled. So it's super, super important to model everything. There was no interaction. It was just kind of a forced situation. Yeah, so it's a really good example. Um, all right, now take a look at the difference here. Lots of things can go. Good reading. And I love go, the use of go. a sibling. Cars go. They do. Cars go. go. Trains go. Trains go. go. 
tracks go. Tracks go. Go. See, Mom's only using one button. You can do this. Boats go. Philip, do boats go? Go. They do. Go. You're right. Boats go. <gasps> Look at that. Planes go. Planes go. go. Motorcycles go. They do. They go. go. What else do you know that can go, go, go? <gasps> Hmm, let's think about that. Philip, let's look at this. What other things can go? go? Yeah. Let's look at the word list. And I think if we find this one with all the cars, it's called transportation. What are the things on here that go? Mm. Do you see anything? Mm. Do you see so anything cute. that might go? Yeah. Car, ins car insurance. Car insurance? Well, yeah. if you are going to go in a car, car, then you would need car insurance before you go. That's true. What about this one? Airplane. Airplane. Yeah. Russell, do airplanes go? Yeah. They do. What about... Bus. A bus. Does a bus oh. go? Car wash. Car wash, yeah. If you go in your car and it gets really dirty, you should take it to the car wash. Okay, Lots so you see the difference here. Um, this was just a magical, so nice, slow rate. She's modeling the whole time. She's got a sibling modeling. Um, and when he said car insurance, which was not a vehicle, um, she responded. She, she, she talked to, he would now learn what car insurance might be, might, you know, he might learn something about car insurance. Um, she talks a little bit about the navigation. She explains that if he's gonna look for something that goes, that he should look in the transportation category. She's modeling the navigation. She's slow, she's not forcing anything. Um, this was just a beautiful, beautiful example. I was jumping for joy when I found this example because it can be really hard to find um, really, really good models of modeling. Um, so uh, I really, really love uh, this particular example. So I encourage you to go back and watch it um, you know, at your leisure. Okay. So the other one, you know, we've got a lot of pitfalls to run through and I've got like 10 minutes. So I'm gonna kind of go through these kind of on the fast side, um, demanding communication. So possible outcomes to demanding your child's language would be frustration, meltdown, refusal, um, ignoring you. Uh, because remember that your child, because they have a disability, they already have less control over their life than a, a typically developing child would have. Um, you know, you have to manage things, you have to keep them safe, you have to structure their day more. Um, so they already have less control than they might have had otherwise. Um, and when you make language something to control them with, one way for them to feel some, some power and some control is to not give you language. Um, so we should, again, focus on the interaction, not a specific response that you want them to give you. Um, I'm not even going to play this. I want you to be aware of Rachel Madel. So um, you can go back to the slides. You can watch this. This is a short little video where she talks about to inspire language but not require them. And Rachel also has a bunch of other, um, she does a lot of parent coaching and her YouTube channel is chock full of really, really nice videos. So I wanted you to be aware of them. Uh, we don't have to watch it now. Um, you can go back and watch. You could even just go to her YouTube and kind of click through. Um, she gives some fabulous, fabulous advice. Let's keep moving. Okay, these, this, these next two slides are really important. So you want to avoid using language that places demands on your child. So you want to avoid saying something like, what is this? Tell me, uh, tell me. So, you know, say chip, T tell me chip, push chip. Um, you know, if you want a chip, say chip. You know, you need to ask me for chip. So tell, tell me I want the chip in a sentence or, you know, use your words. Remember, if, you, if your child can use their words either with natural speech or with their, with their device, they will if they can or they want to. So stay, saying use your words is, is actually not a, a, not a helpful, um, a not a helpful uh, encouragement. Okay, so we don't want to do those. Instead, 
um, you want to avoid things that place demands on your child and instead uh, say things like, oh, I wonder what you want when you went to the, the foods page. I wonder what you want. You could be like, ah, well, I like to eat candy. And I like to eat chips. Oh, I do not like uh, Brussels sprouts. I wonder what you would like to eat and then stop and count and look at them. And then if they go in and they say bubbles, you could go, oh, bubbles? You eat bubbles? Oh, I'm gonna go to describing. Oh, that is yucky. Go with it, go with it. Don't worry that they're not saying candy like you think they should be saying. Um, so things like, I wonder, I wonder uh, which thing you like, or maybe, um, so let's say that they're reaching up on the shelf and you're, you're pretty sure that they're reaching for um, some candy that's up there. You could say, oh, you're reaching up there on the shelf. I wonder if maybe you want the candy. If you use the word maybe, you're not making the assumption that you can read their mind. You're just giving them language um, just in case that's what they were saying. So these are really, really good phrases to use. So I would um, you know, write those down. So we ask way too many questions. Um, and Gail Porter, Porter and Linda Mark Burkhardt talk about the fact that once the child has achieved some level of communicative competence for expressing their own ideas, only then can they actually answer another person's request to answer their question. So, you know, they need to have some level of, of familiarity and some language level with their system before they can answer your questions. That's why it's so important to just focus on that interaction. Um, so avoid asking all those questions, follow their lead, comment rather than asking them questions, record yourself. You'll be shocked at how many questions that sound like tests that you ask them. It's again, human nature, um, record yourself. Avoid questions where you know the answer. What's your name? What did you eat for breakfast? Um, we don't do that with typically developing kids. So, um, you know, not the best idea for, and we tend to do that with, with kids with disabilities for some reason. Um, and ask yourself, am I testing or am I teaching or am I interacting? We don't wanna be testing. Um, we asked way too many yes, no questions, um, which are forced choices. Uh, they also may not have a solid yes and no. It's kind of abstract, um, you know, and they require very limited language output. Yes or no? How much are they really learning if you always ask yes or no questions? So instead, ask open-ended questions, offer choices in a list, um, provide the option of something else um, or the word different. You know, oh, do you want the chips, the, um, the candy, or something different? And you could use the word different. Different is a great word to teach. And, you know, there's no failure. It's just interaction. Um, here's another one that you can go back to, some uh, strategies for having your child talk faster. I'm not going to play that. Um, this is another pitfall, focusing on communicating only wants and needs. Wants and needs are important. We do need to know, especially when someone has complex communication needs, because um, they can't just say it. They, they need to use their system. Um, but, you know, share, complaining or um, asking a question, think about how, how early kids ask questions. You know, they have 25 to 50 words under their belt and they're already asking questions. Um, we need to be supporting all of those types of functions, not just wants and needs. This was something I made years ago. Um, out of my own frustration, and every classroom that I went into, that, that all the teachers would say and all the families would say, well, I want him to be able to ask for what he wants. And I'd say, well, that's important, but that's not at all. It's not everything. Um, so we need to be focusing on all of those functions, answering questions, expressing feelings, directing someone's actions, telling on somebody, um, you know, complaining, all those kinds of things. Um, don't assume that you know what your child um, is thinking or what they're trying to express. Do you know your child better than anyone? I'm sure you do, um, but you are not a mind reader. This is a blog post. You'll see the underline here that will connect you to a blog post from Dana Nieder, who is a mom to Maya, who is an AAC user, um, who has, she's used it with Maya since Maya was like 18 months old, I think. Um, and then Dana went back and became a speech language pathologist. Um, and she has a nice blog post that explains, I'm not a mind reader and neither are you. 
Um, so, you know, really try hard to determine your child's intent. You know, and you do that providing, you know, model, providing and modeling robust, robust vocabulary, providing, you know, an AAC system all the time. Um, if you have a situation where maybe it's not ideal to have the, the high tech system, your avas on the iPad because you're going to go in the pool. Um, there are other things you can do. You can have laminated copies of some of the screens. You can always take a screenshot and laminate that with like thick laminate. Um, there's something called a Pixie Pal, P I C S P E E P A L, Pixie, P I C S, Pixie Pal, hold on, P I C S E E P A L, um, which is kind of like a, a, a plastic book where you can insert paper um, that's it's pretty water resistant um, that can be used on the beach or, or you could use laminate um, or you could use you know, some, a Ziploc baggie. Um, there's all kinds of things you could use. Um, teach language by attributing meaning. So look at that, attributing meaning is that you know, if they um, are grunting and, um, and you know, trying to you know, reach something, you would say, oh, you know what? It seems like maybe you're trying to get the candy. You can't quite reach it. You're trying to get the candy. So maybe you could say, help me get the candy. You, know, you could say that. Um, and then you give them the language that they could use, but don't require in that moment, don't require that they do it to get the candy. You model it and then you make a determination, is it candy time or is it not candy time? You could say, you can model it and say, oh, I hear you want the candy, but it's not candy time later, later. Um, assume that your child's attempt was intentional. Even if maybe they hit the wrong button, you want to teach them their opinions and thoughts matter. They control their own words. They control their own body. Communication is worth the effort and that other people will listen to them. So here's a set of, of commandments that Vicki Clark, who is a private practitioner in uh, Georgia in the USA, um, you know, thou shalt start with motivating activities. Thou shalt be sure I am engaged. If I'm not interested, thou shalt start over with a motivating activity. Uh, talk using my symbols or AAC system. Avoid laying hands on me. Um, shall not force me to communicate, shall be patient and wait for me, shall not take away my AAC system. If you have a situation where it is that obtrusive um, with maybe tons of stimming or something like that, then at least um, you could say, well, we're not going to use the talker right now, but here's your paper copy and you can have those printed out. We never, ever want to completely remove an AAC system, even if you have to put a, a paper copy, as long as you have access to that vocabulary, but you want to try not to remove it at all. Um, encourage me to comment, share, and ask questions, and always believe I can do it. These are great commandments from Vicki. So be kind to yourself. AAC takes time. It is a marathon, not a sprint, but it, boy, is it a, a meaningful marathon. When you reach the end, um, what, what you've achieved is, is your child become an autonomous communicator. Um, so you've got this, you, you can do this. Um, I thank you for spending this uh, hour with me. I really hope that, I know we didn't have time for a Q&A, um, but these were, these were points that I thought were really, really important to make. Um, so I wanted to get through all the, um, all the information that I had to share with you in this session. Um, and I hope you come away um, learning something that you didn't know before you joined me. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren, for this very engaging session. Uh, always something to learn when you're talking um, and a lot of useful tips. And I hope parents found it really useful. Uh, and I really appreciate your taking some time out, even in your busy schedule of a full-time job. And it's, it's been great. Great. No um, would you have any time to take any question at all? It's going to be six. Um, six. Uh, like a, maybe one question because I do have to I do have to roll I gotta go to work <laughs> um, yeah. so when the when the child starts a word how do you maintain consistency I'm not sure what you mean by that okay uh, is it good to give verbal prompt to a kid having echolalia um, well, with the child, first of all, you can you can try to figure out if they have echolalia. I mean, usually you echolalia echolalia is um, is serving a purpose. Actually, you know, they are there are, are 
Um, they don't have the language yet, so they are kind of repeating. Um, what I would do, it's not necessarily the verbal prompts, is that you want to model what it is that you want them to say. Um, so if they have echolalia, it means that their speech is developing, which is awesome. The important thing to know is the more you use AAC, the more likely you are to see improvements in their natural speech as well as some AAC use. So my suggestion for kids who have echolalia um, is to model as much as possible um, using your speech, obviously. Um, so you're, you're commenting, you're, you know, you're using your speech, but then also those key words on the system. Um, so, you know, focusing on the, the full modeling rather than just verbal prompts. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, yeah, I and, think. You know, and have just to start. So this will be the last one. Um, you know, think about when, when you watched Kate with Bodhi um, and that ball, the best place to start is with something that your child loves. If your child loves a ratty piece of string that they carry around all day that they call a, a, a squiggy, then start with playing with their squiggy and you can throw the squiggy up, let's go, you know, up or I mean, it, it doesn't, whatever it is that they love, think about that second video with the sibling and the mom, or think about Kate's video where they're rolling a ball into a wooden box. It's just about something that is engaging the child. It doesn't matter exactly what it is that you are, you know, the, the more you begin to interact, the more you'll be able to model different things. You'll learn the system a little better. Um, so starting is just jump in, figure out what your kid loves um, and talk about it. Focus on the interaction and you are most welcome. Yeah. I wish I could hang around for a couple more minutes to ask yeah. to answer questions, but I, I got to go see a student. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, right. Lauren. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really appreciate your taking some time out for us. Okay. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And have a good one. Take care. Yeah, uh, you too. Uh, so the rest of you, please do uh, take the poll. I'm just launching the poll and then a quick uh, survey. Yeah, uh, Lauren, you can. Uh, yep, I'm exit. going. Yep. You can go. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can take a quick poll on how you would recommend this session. And uh, when you exit, there will be a survey that will pop up. And uh, if you can please share your feedback there, it would be great. Yeah, and Lauren has been a wonderful, uh, she's been a constant here uh, for our AAC webinars. Any other questions anyone has? And she showed that wonderful video about uh, how not to model and how not to uh, respond. That was great. Yeah, we will be putting up a recording of the session soon. Yeah, certainly, Melissa, we'll be sharing it on our website on the same page that you did the registrations. This will be available. Yes, you can use your own images in Avas. Uh, you can add the all the items that your child is interested in and then start modeling with the core words as they did roll and all of that. So make sure that you use the code words and uh, engage with the child on his interests. Okay, uh, I'm ending the poll. If anyone wants to still vote, okay. Uh, okay, so thank you so much for joining us and make sure that uh, uh, you log in next week, same day, same time. Yeah, absolute pleasure to listen to Lauren always. She's a, she, she's a wonderful, speech therapist and has always really simple ideas to share and if you haven't seen it please do watch last year's also all the all the webinars were great um uh, please uh, go to our website and check out that and um, yeah so we look forward to seeing you all back next week same day same time and next week's will be by anjana 
Satyaboda and uh, she will be talking on uh, daily use of uh, AAC, how you can integrate it into your daily lives. So please do join in. Uh, need explanation modeling without expecting a response. Uh, so she had shown the video, uh, Dhyana Anbu, that uh, how do you model without expecting a response? Like the first video that she showed where the mother and the sibling are there, where she just kept modeling and she didn't enforce a response from the child. She didn't force the child to respond. Whereas the second video that she showed where she was forcing the child to tap and using the physical prompt, all of which were complete no-nos. That's uh, what we've heard from uh, Lauren always and from all the SLPs. Um, yeah, so I hope that was, so without response is without expecting the child's response. So you continue modeling, even if the child doesn't respond, it's fine. You just continue to model and uh, try after many models, you can try prompting. And uh, as she explained, there's a hierarchy in prompting. So you don't just start with a physical prompt, which is uh, to be avoided at uh, if, if possible. And even if you have to do a physical, she said, do hand under hand where the child's hand is on top and your hand is at the bottom. And you just guide the child to the correct response this way. So you don't take control of the child by doing a hand over hand, but do a hand under hand. I hope that was uh, useful. I share the link for this program in the mail. Um, you can go back to the registration page and on the same page, you'll find a link. Uh, we'll upload the, instead of the registration link, we'll upload the video there. This will, this video will be uploaded next week. Okay, so any other questions or we can end the session and I request you to please take the survey as soon as the session is done. Thank you so much for joining in all of us, uh, all of you here and uh, we appreciate your time. See you next week. Bye-bye.